We're very happy to have Damien Fish back as our speaker today. Thank you. Uh, he's talked about me shaking hands. I'm not shaking any of y'all's hands with this coronavirus going on. I got this sanitizer right here, so I'm trying to shake my hand. I'm going to dap y'all up real quick. Just kidding. Listen, I I'm so glad to be here. Let me give you a little bit more background about myself. I'm going to leave that alone. That's like a turnover. Uh, so for me, I am originally from Kentucky. All right, so I'm going to tell you exactly what I'm going to talk to you about. First things first, my mentor, he always told me with every speaking engagement to follow the five B's and I would stay out of trouble. Those five B's would be brief. Be brief, brother. Be brief. So that's what I'm going to do this morning. I'll be in and I'll be out. But I do want your undivided attention. I'm going to talk to you about three things. Work ethic, attitude, and commitment. I think those three things will get you anywhere you want to go in life. Uh, when I talk about work ethic, you know, so, so part of my background is, is ESPN as an analyst. The other part is wealth management. I'm a financial advisor with Morgan Stanley. I was at Merrill Lynch for about 10 years. And then I was at Morgan Stanley, and I've been at Morgan Stanley since 2013. And the one thing that you learn extremely early when I talk about work ethic, if you go to Turkey, uh, you're going to have to purchase things with what's called a lira in that currency. Uh, you go to Germany, France, you can use the euro. You go to China, you can use the yuan. Uh, but the reason I talk about work ethic is because greatness is purchased with the currency of hard work. Greatness is purchased with the currency of hard work. You wouldn't have gotten here this morning without having some type of work ethic. And this work ethic that you have to have, you're going to use it no matter what you do. Now, right now, all of you guys are bas bouncing a basketball. You're coaching. Uh, but the work ethic stems from a very young age. And for me, I am from Kentucky. So imagine a guy from Kentucky. I know you guys are from all over. But for me, when my dad, when I was nine years old, he put me on a farm making $4 an hour. And imagine a guy who was nine years old, pretty tall kid. Uh, they put me in a barn. Uh, how many of y'all have ever heard of tobacco, raising tobacco, housing tobacco? Not many? Few? So, so I was in this barn, if you can imagine, and a barn has tiers that are built all the way up. So while I'm in that barn, I'm on a tier and I'm spread it out wide like this. So I'm learning work ethic. So what they have is they have the tobacco that's on a stick. And for me, I would have to reach the stick from below me, put it on the bottom tier, take the next stick from the guy that's below me, put it on a tier here, and then take one more stick and put it above me on the tier here who a guy was sitting, sitting over me. Whether that's the barn, whether that's washing cars, I don't care if you, you're trying to be a criminal, if you're trying to be a pastor, if you're trying to be a coach, no matter what you do, you're going to have to have work ethic. And I know a lot of you guys have learned that already. Uh, but in order to have that type of work ethic, you have to have discipline. Uh, we talked about, or I talked about jokingly about the coronavirus earlier, but success runs from the undisciplined like the plague. Success runs from the undisciplined like the plague. And so it's so important for you when you have that work ethic to maintain your discipline. Uh, that's going to respond the same way. That's going to be in regards to being a father, being a husband one day, being a basketball player, being a coach. Uh, I, I am huge with a lot of my athletes. I manage money for over 100 plus athletes uh, at Morgan Stanley and coaches. And one of the biggest challenges for those athletes is what Dan just talked about, when that basketball stops. Now, I know everybody in here thinks you're going to be an NBA player. Everybody. When I was sitting in your seat, I did too. News flash. Not everybody in here is going to be an NBA player. Real talk. So, even if you are an NBA player, okay, when that basketball stops bouncing, the reason why athletes have 68% of those athletes go bankrupt or broke within two years of retiring is because they don't have a game plan for their second season. 
<laughs> See, what you got to realize is that people out here, quote unquote, don't just care about you. They don't just care about you. That's the world. They care about what you bring to the table. So you have to understand at a very early age, I don't care if it's your coach, if it's your boss, they're going to be concerned about what you bring to the table. It is your job to help manifest your God-given gifts to make sure whatever it is that you're called to do, whatever it is that you're good at, whatever your gifts are, that you manifest to where you can bring that to the table. Work ethic and the discipline, those two go together. So for my athletes, when they retire, the first thing that I'm concerned about is, what are you going to do when you finish? Now, I think something that a lot of people are missing out on, a lot of athletes want to go into coaching. A lot of athletes want to do what I'm doing. They want to work for ESPN or CBS or TNT, work for television networks. And one of the reasons athletes love to do that is from an ego standpoint, they, they, they are able to, to maintain their relevance, right? You heard Draymond Green joking on Charles a little bit, talking about the fact that he, he's working that job because he needs that job. Charles is a close friend, and trust me, he doesn't need that job. He gets a couple million dollars just to do one Capital One commercial. But my point is, when you finish, when you finish your career, you need to have an idea of what your second season is, what your gift is. Now, that could be officiating. A lot of your top officials in the SEC, where I do a lot of my commentating, minimum of six figures, you know? And so when people are laughing and saying you may not want to put these stripes on, it's a way to provide for your family. A lot of the major SEC officials make three, four hundred thousand dollars. Obviously, coaches, right, in the coaching rank. Uh, but I will say this: if you're going to get into coaching when you finish, do not get in coaching just for the money. You can ask all of your coaches here. If you're getting into coaching for the money, you're in it for the wrong reasons. Your coaches here today, 99% of the coaches are in it because they want to make make an impact on you. They want to make an impact on your families. So realize that. Uh, not just commentating, not just officiating, uh, but I think more people can pursue the agent arena. Uh, I was able and blessed to, to pursue both the ESPN arena and then the financial advising arena. My goal is to help every individual turn every dollar they make into a lifetime employee. Every dollar you make, eventually, you want to turn into a lifetime employee. Remember that, okay? Second of all, attitude. I think attitude is so crucial. Um, I think it was Nelson Mandela that said, courage is not the absence of fear, but the willing to triumph over it. And you have to be courageous to have a, a positive attitude. Uh, it's easy for and I live in Atlanta, Georgia right now. You definitely have to have a positive attitude there with that traffic. It's easy for one thing to happen to actually throw you off. It's easy for something to happen for an official to make a call against you or a coach to set you down when you don't think you should be getting set down or for a coach to get on you about something that you feel like that you're more than capable of doing and you change your attitude. Your attitude is a key to everything, right? Where you're going to be in life is based on not the 90% of what happens to you, or not the 10% of what happens to you, but the 90% of how you react to it, right? And so when you look at all the adversity that's going to come into your life, I want you to think about yourself as, as a sailboat, right? You're on a sailboat, and you're the captain. So... You have different winds, different rain, different weather that's going to come across to you. You're going to have uh, injuries that may come across to you. You may have challenges with your families that's going to come across. The difference in where you and the guy next to you is going to end up is how you set the sail. It's how you set the sail. That's going to determine where you start and where you finish. I got a guy right now who's a close friend of mine. And this is why I talk about attitude. And this is why I also talk about what you're doing. You are more than that basketball that you're bouncing. That's why I'm here today to tell you that. Basketball has given me a gift. 
It's built a tremendous life. The average financial advisor at, Will, at Morgan Stanley makes 300K plus a year. Uh, ESPN analysts have a great job. But I am more than basketball. You are more than basketball. My close friend, his little brother two nights ago, who was a football player and played professional football, literally, literally two nights ago, just got locked up for homicide and murder. Now, I tell you that because in a blink of an eye, it can change. Um, I, was, I was actually in a situation where I was driving about a year ago. And I actually was driving, officer was behind me, and you know, I, he put on his lights. I was doing 60 and 65. So no way that I think he was pulling me over. Well, I pulled over, and he pulled over. So I'm like, well, maybe he is coming after me. I pulled over again, he pulled over again. Well, then I pulled all the way over. I figured this guy's trying to pull me over for some reason. Well, as soon as he, get, as soon as he gets there, he has his hand on his holster. And I'm wondering, why in the world does he have his hand on his holster? All I did, I'm going 16 and 65, and he says, what do you do when an officer pulls up behind you? I said, excuse me? What do you do when an officer pulls up behind you with his sirens on? I said, I don't know, officer. He said, well, you need to move out of the way. If there's a faster car behind you, you need to be moved out of the way. He said, instead, you take your time, you go over three lanes and almost get myself and my partners hurt. Now at this time I'm looking in my rear view mirror, another police officer's pulled up and he has his hand on his holster. Now, whenever he pulled me over, I already had my driver's license, proof of insurance, hand on the steering wheel. But I tell you that story, now I said, I said, obviously officer I would never do anything to endanger you or yourself or your team. He says, okay sir, thanks for your time, have a good day. I tell you that story to impact, hopefully that it impacts you, the power of the attitude. Because we've seen, whether it be on TV, social media, whatever it is, a different attitude at that time could have went a different way. Attitude, your attitude, how you respond to adversity. Coach Bruce Pearl, who's down at Auburn, he says this all the time, and I love the fact that he says this. He says, Adversity doesn't build character, it reveals character. So how you respond to the challenges that occur to you, it's not gonna build your character, but it reveals who you are. It reveals what happens when you have these challenges. Your attitude is the difference between you shooting 65% or you shooting 80%, right? It's time for each and every one of you, you're all of age now, right? six years old, eight years old, even 12 years old, 12 years of age, you can kind of blame, you know, this didn't happen or that didn't happen. You're at the point now where you can't blame anyone else for where you're at but yourself. No excuses. No excuses. Again, that boils down to attitude, right? I could have made an excuse because when I was a freshman in college and made the all SEC freshman team at Auburn, I could have made an excuse that I had an injury, that I had a torn cartilage, or that I had a dislocated finger, or that I had a hyperextended knee, or a fractured ankle, which is why I got waved with Miami, or I had a broken knuckle. I could have made an excuse, or I could reveal my character. And in spite of any of those challenges, allow myself to move forward in what I felt like is my God-given purpose. Attitude. Next, commitment. I, I love this last part because commitment always boils down to your why, right? Why do you want to be successful? Why do each one of you, yeah, you get to the NBA, five, six hundred, thousand minimum you know you make a big time contract when you get to the NBA but but why you want to get a house for your mom you want to make a lot of money 
Want to buy a nice car, nice clothes? Why? If your why is big enough, then you can overcome any obstacle. A better way to say it is, when your why is big enough, the obstacle will cease to exist. If, if something that's prohibiting you is you getting a certain score on an SAT or ACT, something's prohibiting you is from you developing that jump shot, developing your ball handling, uh, your conditioning. Your why is what's going to carry you. Your why is what's going to get you from point A to point B. Now, everybody has their own why. My why is simple, right? Some of it boils down to my parents and what they did to sacrifice. But more than anything, for me, my why is I want to glorify my Savior, Jesus Christ. That's my why. You have a right to choose your own why, okay? Everybody has a right to do that. But the key is when you're facing adversity, when you're facing a challenge, your why is what's going to take you to that next step. Now, when you have this commitment that I'm talking about, this commitment has to continue to carry you through these obstacles. So when, you, when I talk about NBA athletes that I manage money for and NFL guys, the, the one thing that, that really challenges them more than anything is when they see that check cut in half. When they, when they find out what Uncle Sam gets, when they find out taxes. Because you say 68% broke or bankrupt within two years of retirement. So let's break it down, right? Let's say you get a $10 million, $10 million contract. How much is that after taxes? Anybody know? Huh? Six. After taxes? After taxes, best case, you're going to take home $6 million. So when everybody sees you and they say, man, you just signed for $10 million. You paid. Okay? think that's a lot of money. So you got $6 million now. $6 million, and that's just what you take home. So let's say it's a four-year deal. $6 million over four years is what? 1.5 a year. So now you got 1.5 a year, you gotta live. So let's say you're prudent and you live on a half a million dollars a year, <laughs> which is tough to do if you're in a West Coast city or New York. But let's say you live on a half a million dollars a year. So over those four years, that's $2 million. Now you got $4 million left. Well, you gotta realize everywhere you go from that point on, you expected to get every tab at every restaurant, at every club, Everywhere you go, you're expected to get that for yourself and for your entire family. When their flights, even though your family used to get their own flights, they expect you to get it now. When they come watch you play, they expect you to stay, you to pay for that room that they're staying in now. And let's say, oh, by the way, I want to take care of mom for the rest of my life. Okay? Let's say you go when you're 20, mom's 50, so you want to give her $5,000 a month. You know, just take care of mama. Give her $5,000 a month. Well, $5,000 a month times 12 is what? 60000 Same thing. 60000 is the equivalency of making 100000 a year. So if you take care of mom for 10 years, you got to make a million dollars just to take care of mom for 10 years. And we're hoping that mama lives a lot longer than that, aren't we? So if mama's 50 and she lives to 80, you got to make $3 million just to take care of mom to pay her those $5,000 a month for the next 30 years. Real talk. That's why 68% are bankrupt or broke within two years of when they retire. Work ethic, attitude, and commitment. You take care of those three things, and you're going to be just fine. Now, before I step down real quick, I am an ESPN analyst, so Morgan Stanley's my day job. I'm going to talk to you real quick before I open it up for questions because I do have to go be on the air in about three hours for this SEC tournament. Um, literally, I, I think this is going to be the best March Madness ever. Uh, I think the parity that's, that's gone on in college basketball has been phenomenal. Uh, when you look at some of the number one seeds and top seeds right now, I do think 
that this could be the first year uh, that you do have a mid-major to win it all. Uh, we, we've had you know, VCU that's get there. We've had Butler that's gotten there. We've had Wichita State, but nobody's ever been able to take it all. And I think when you look at the guys who are having success from the mid-major level, the Kawhi Leonard's, um, that, that the talent level has now spread out. And one of the reason is because of a league like this. Balance the playing field out, which I think is great for college basketball. So this year, I'll give you my quick feedback. Dayton is for real. Uh, I think Obi Toppin is the best player in the country. Uh, he's definitely one of the more exciting players in the country. Even though I spent a lot of my time in the SEC, uh, I do think Anthony Edwards is probably the best that I've seen in college basketball. I think he's got the best upside this year. Um, I know a lot of people love LaMelo Ball, James Wiseman, but I think from what I've seen from Anthony Edwards in person uh, that he's going to be someone that's just too hard to miss out on. Uh, another team right now, not only are they ranked number one, but I told people this probably about two months ago, even though the AP voters didn't quite figure it out. I've always thought Kansas was the best team in the country. Uh, Kansas right now, uh, with Yudoki Azebuki, uh, is proof that back to the basket uh, basketball is not dead. I know everybody out here wants to be the next Kevin Durant. Uh, a lot of people don't want to give credit to old school bigs, but think about it like this on how the game's changed. Four out, one in, if you actually understand what you're doing, if you actually got someone that's teaching you the quality footwork and is turning you into a cerebral player, then you ought to be able to operate even better as a back-to-the-basket player. Uh, Anthony Davis, Carl Anthony Towns, those two guys come to my mind because i got to talk about Kentucky in a little bit. But those guys both, even though they play perimeter basketball, they eat with their back-to-the-basket game. It does you no good whatsoever, no good, if you 6'9", 6'10", and you get a little short guy like me, 6'5", on you, and you can't do work. You can't post up. One of the greatest basketball players of all time, Michael Jordan, we can argue, Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, LeBron James, we can argue that. To me, Michael's the GOAT, always will be. Uh, but it was the back to, I like that round of applause, right? Set the clothes. <laughs> but to me, <laughs> to me, the, 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 what separated Michael and what is going to help LeBron get in the conversation is if he can develop his back to the basket game. 6'9", 265, all muscle. So when everybody wants to get out there and be James Harden, take it between the legs and do the step back, work on your inside game. Continue to improve that. Uh, some sleepers for March Madness. I actually like Oregon. Uh, Dana Allman does a tremendous job. He has a great style of play. Uh, and I think, once again, Oregon will be a sleeper and shock some people in the tournament. Out of the SEC, I'm going to do the SEC tournament. There's four teams that are projected to get in. I do think Mississippi State will get in. Uh, they're going to probably have to win a game. If they win a game and they lose or play Kentucky well, they'll probably be good. Uh, but I think out of the SEC, Kentucky and Auburn at this time are the best two teams uh, that will be projected to do the best in conference play. Uh, Last thing I'll say is just don't limit. Don't limit yourself. Have a big mind and have your own mind. Uh, it's changed a lot. When I was coming up, I didn't have social media. And I purposefully do not do a lot of social media right now because I feel like I can control my brand in different ways. I'm not saying, look, LeBron James getting 300K to do something on social media. So the money is there. It's real. Uh, but, but when you talk about mental health and everything that's going on around young people, realize what's real and what's fake, right? Realize the difference between what you're scrolling down on Instagram, what's real and what's fake. And last thing, but not least, is listen, man. Listen. Man, I know, because I used to be in your seat. Uh, we had a top seven top eight recruiting class when I came into Auburn. And you think you know it all. But the inability to listen, the unwillingness to actually take constructive criticism and advice 
is like you having access to Google Maps or Waves. If you like Waves, avoid the cops. If you, if you have that Google Maps, then, and it's telling you there's a wreck 10 miles down the road, and it gives you an option that's going to save you 30 minutes, and you don't take it. That's what it's like not listening. You will never, you will never reach your full potential if you don't learn to listen. Whether it's me, whether it's your coach, whether it's your mentor, whether it's your parents. And don't allow that excuse to say, well, you haven't been what I've been through. Everybody's been through something. Matter of fact, if you're growing up in the, in the United States, then I don't care who you are and where you're from, you're part of the wealthiest country in America. You won't see some people struggle then go to Haiti. Go to Haiti where people are sleeping on dirt floors, okay? Go to Haiti where, where my father literally just left as a, as a mercenary and as, and a, as a missioner, missionary and gave everything he had but the clothes on his back. You got it pretty good right now. You got it pretty good right now. Uh, Matt's going to come up in a little bit and speak to you about the NCAA. Uh, I, I'll say this too. When you go to school, man, get your education. Everybody here thinks they're going to be the next LeBron James, the next Kobe Bryant. Your education, again, that basketball is going to stop. And when it stops, for those of you all who think you know it all, you ever been taking a shower and the water immediately go cold on you and you can't get out quick enough? For those of you all who think you know it all, there's going to be a point in life when that happens if you don't listen, if you don't prepare for life after basketball. That water's going to go cold just like that. I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen time and time again with people who don't listen. All right? I got about five. I'm going to open it up for questions before I get out. Either you're really, really smart or y'all scared. What was, the, what was the process? So after you figured out, hey, basketball wasn't the thing I wanted to do, what, what was your cold water moment, so to speak? Mm. How, how did you say, I want to go to ESPN? Like, sure. What, what, what transcended that progress? Like, for, for people who don't know, how can you say, this is my passion now, I want to go here? What is your cold water moment? Good question. So he asked me, what was my cold water moment? When did I realize uh, that I had to do something besides basketball? When I was in Miami, and because of my knee and my torn cartilage, I didn't get drafted and get to play in the NBA and was going to have to go to the, to the D League at the time, which is now called the G League. Uh, I went back home and realized I didn't have any money. And some people wouldn't tell you this, but I just love giving you real talk. At that time, I was in Auburn. I was sitting on the side of the road. I don't even smoke. But I seen a bunch of other guys do it, so I got a black and mild. <laughs> I'm sitting on the side of the road. At least I know you're listening now. Black and mild was the best response I got. Man. So, so I'm, I'm sitting on the side, and I'm flat broke. And the director of ops, who I was upset with because he gave some other players on my team better shoes than me, who were projected All-American, came up to me and he said, what's wrong? And I said, I'm flat broke. I refuse to go to my parents as a man. I don't know how I'm going to get my next meal. And literally, he gave me $300 at the time. That $300 was a lot of ham and cheese sandwiches. I used to put toaster, eat the same ham and cheese sandwiches. Matter of fact, until I was able to go overseas and make about $25, $30 a month, I actually was working at an Econo Lodge, 11 to 7. I worked at 11 to 7 on, a mid, uh, on the night shift because I didn't want anybody to see that I didn't make it, that I didn't need money, that I, hadn't, that I, I felt like that I failed. But the one thing that I will say is it didn't build my character, but it revealed my character. Because the, the, the worst thing that I could have done at that time is 
feel like that I was too good to work at the Econo Lodge, that I was too good to clean bathrooms, or I was too good to do whatever. That was that, that, was that moment for me. After that time, came back, started working on the Auburn Network. People said I had a face for radio at that time. Boy, are they wrong now, <laughs> right? Uh, when I was doing radio, the, the price they were paying me to do one radio show now, they pay me 20 times that now at ESPN. Uh, my coach always told me, he said, I don't care what you're making for your job. If you're making $100 on a job, treat it like you're making 100000 Treat it like you're making a million dollars, and eventually that's the amount of money that you're going to make on that job. It's the same thing for you. If you want to be not only an NBA player, but an NBA all-star, if you want to be a top collegiate player, whatever you want to be, you have to have that type of mindset and that type of work ethic right now. And if you do that, you'll eventually get there. Anything else? Yeah, you, you spoke about attitude. You spoke about attitude. So a, a lot of a lot, a lot of people, when they are good players, right? They have a certain attitude that has allowed them to get through. Sure. Right? When they no longer have or the ball stops bouncing, and they're no longer that player that's needed, right? Sometimes they struggle with adjusting their attitude. What can you speak to that? Because I know some people who they may be big time players in, 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 in high school now, sure, but then have to go to college and be a role player, mm. right? And then they lose sight of what their goal is or what their why is, right? So what do you offer or speak to that? So, so the question was for players that. Uh, have been substantially successful in their careers at a certain level uh, when they get to college or when they get to the NBA and they're having to play a different role than they played on that high school team, uh, what do I advise them in order to overcome that adversity? A large glass of humility. A large glass of work ethic. That same thing, that work ethic, that attitude, that commitment. Because I promise you this, we talk about the GOAT, we talk about the best players of all time. At some point in your life, and it's probably happened to a lot of you now, somebody's going to get you. Somebody's going to put you in your place, in your lane, no matter how aggressive you are, how confident you are, somebody's going to put you there. And when that happens, do you have the character? Do you have the foundation, the roots, uh, to continue to be humble but hungry? That would be my answer to his question. Remain humble, remain hungry, and also, and this is huge, keep that circle as small as possible. Because the more you continue to, uh, to elevate, whether that be as a celebrity, whether that be uh, financially, the more you continue to elevate, the more people are going to try to get into your circle. And you're responsible for your circle. You're the CEO for your circle. You make that decision, right? I talked about players doing stuff for their parents. <coughs> you owe your family, your coaches, and yourself, but your family and coaches do that not because of what they think they're gonna get off of you. They do that because they're invested in you. They want you to be successful. So whenever you run into that situation, like he said, remember your why, stay humble, stay hungry, and just continue to grind. You also talked about work ethic. Uh, Cause I've heard, I've heard different um, opinions on this. Do you feel that Work ethic is something that someone has, or do you think you can teach somebody what work ethic is? Mm, good question. Is work ethic that some is work ethic something that I feel like someone has, or that someone can get, or be taught? I think everyone has the ability to work, right? 
And that's what I tell my clients, right? Even, even if you want to take care of this person or that person, still allow them to work. If you're healthy and have the ability to work, you should. And it's the same thing in regards to work ethic. You can make the choice. Listen, I see so many players. Uh, Buzz Williams was talking about it at Texas A&M the other day. Frank Martin. Being at ESPN, I met and visited with every coach in the country. And the one consistency is your decision. You got to make a decision between the ears on your work ethic, right? And so you don't have to be born with it. Maybe, maybe you didn't grow up like I grew up to where your parents had you doing stuff at an early age. Maybe you were spoiled a little bit. Maybe you were pampered. Well, at any point in your life, you have the decision that you can make that I want to work to get to a certain level. It's all between the years. And it's consistency, right? It's consistency. A lot of people work hard on Monday. They may even work hard on Tuesday. But then Wednesday comes, and you get distracted. Then Thursday comes. You say, I'm going to do it Friday. For successful people, there is no tomorrow. For successful people, there is no tomorrow. There's just a long list of todays. You want to know about work? Work was me leaving Atlanta, Georgia last night, going to service one of my biggest accounts, a pension fund in Birmingham, Alabama, Driving, getting to Nashville, checking in with my producer from ESPN at about 1 a.m., getting up this morning, getting me a quick, quick workout in so my button will close today when I go on the screen, coming up here to do this, going back, and then working from about 4 to midnight tonight, and then working 12 hours the rest of the day while I service my clients at Morgan Stanley. Anybody who is successful has to work, and it's going to be a decision that you either make to have work ethic or to not have it. Sure. And this young generation has this illusion of because I have a million followers, that means I'm a fool, I'm a baller, I'm a commodity. Can you speak about that? Sure. Uh, a, a wise man once said that a goal, a goal, right? A lot of you got a goal to make it to the NBA. A goal without discipline is just that, it's an illusion. A goal without discipline is an illusion. And for those of you all who are on social media, number one, man, realize that the world is watching you at all times. Be cognizant about your brand and what you're posting on social media. Uh, be aware of the fact that you're not always just going to play basketball and that somebody who's going to hire you, whether that be a GM that's looking at your track record on social media or a CEO or manager that's hiring you for a job after you finish playing is going to look at your social media. Be cognizant about that. Second of all, in regards to what he said, no doubt about it, you know, uh, people talk to me about it a lot. They want to know how many followers you have. Uh, they want to know how many likes you can get. And there is, a, there is a market from that. There is a branding opportunity from that. But it's still in the teeth, the nuts and bolts, boils down to what you bring to the table. That's why I said that earlier. So just because you have a half a million followers, just because, quote, unquote, you're famous through social media and you're getting a bunch of likes and people are saying nice things, it boils down to what I said earlier. A person has a need, and do you provide that need? It's simple, but it's so real. If I'm an NBA GM and I'm drafting you and I'm looking for a shooter, if you can't shoot, I don't care how many followers you have. If I'm looking for somebody who can run the floor, defend, and block shots, if you can't do that, I don't care how many followers you have. If I'm looking for a good guy to be somebody who I know is going to be a good locker room guy, 
which I've had a couple of players in the first round that G the GMs and agents have told me one of the biggest things that helped them sell them to the team was that they felt like they were going to be a good locker room guy. They felt like they weren't going to have problems to them, problems with them. And that's why they went from second round to a top 16 pick or a lottery pick or a late first round pick. You have to be cognizant about what you bring to the table. Period. I ain't trying to put you out of business or anything, but I teach my kids and any kid who I talk to about financial literacy, like how to take care of your own finances. I know you say Morgan Stanley. Like, can you say the importance of not needing a guy like this? You understand? Like, sure. Take, take control of your own debt, take control of your own money, so we don't have, it's not a lot of good people in your business, so to speak. So I know a lot of athletes from the past who have trusted people in the financial realm and who have burnt them. So yeah. I, I try to teach my athletes, hey guys, learn how to count. Learn how to handle your own money, your own thing. So we won't have to depend on outside entities to help manage something I work so hard for. Can you speak on that? Not sure. No, good question. Uh, and this will be the last one. So his question was, uh, to try to help educate you guys who I hope a lot of you all will make a lot of money one day uh, about financial literacy and the importance of making sure that your money is with an individual and particularly a firm that you can trust. Number one, it's not about how much you make, it's how much you keep. Did y'all hear that? Not about how much you make, it's how much you keep. Because guess what? I don't care how much you make, if you spend more than you make, then you're eventually going to be what? Easy. That's easy math. I make 10, I spend 11, I'm broke. I make 10 million, spend 11 million, I'm broke. Billion, broke. Doesn't matter. So the first thing that every key individual needs to know is your secret to achieving real wealth is having a budget. That's what we talk to our players about. We don't even talk to them about a lot of stocks and bonds and alternative investments and stuff that a lot of you guys probably don't care about right now. We talk to them about taxes, realizing what they're going to have to pay Uncle Sam, and we talk to them about a budget. How many of you guys right now really think you have an idea of what you spend a month? I appreciate your honesty. Most of you don't. Most of you don't. You need to have a budget of what you spend. You, know, you need to know how much you're spending online, whether it's Apple Tunes, whether it's cable, whether it's meal, whether it's gas. Everything that you spend, you have to know what that is. Because if you don't know what that is, then you don't have money to invest. You don't have 9 to 12 months of expenses, which I call sleep good at night money. So if something happens, then you know you have this just to take care of yourself. Until you have that, we don't even need to start talking about investing. You have to have that first. And in regards to his question and what he, what he asked as far as who you deal with, one of the reasons that I'm still with the firm versus being independent is because if Damian Fishback does something to your money that's crooked, well, Damian Fishback has X money, but guess how much Morgan Stanley has? $2.6 in assets. Now, when I was in school, I didn't even count that high. My point is, I realize that 2.6 trillion means if you're with a quality firm that if Damien Fishback was to do something to your money, then you now have the ability to go after the firm who has to monitor Damien Fishback. I have compliance, a compliance department. If I make a certain call, I have to ha make sure it's approved. Uh, if we send money out, I have to make sure it's approved. I may send a wire out for you, and then they're going to call you and say, did you tell Damien Fishback to send a couple of hundred thousand dollar wire out? They're watching me. So you want somebody watching the person who's watching your money. That's what Morgan Stanley does. It's what Merrill Lynch does, what Goldman Sachs does. So make sure that you're at a quality firm, but most importantly, Make sure that you have an individual that you trust. And I don't, it's okay for you to get people that you care about and that you want to empower, right? But make sure that they have the criteria, the talents, the gifts, the expertise, and the competency to do what you are hiring them to do, right? Now, no disrespect to the coaches, but if I'm a coach and I don't, I'm not an accountant, 
then I don't need to be your CPA and doing your taxes. If I'm your principal and I'm not an attorney, then I don't need to be negotiating your contract. Does that make sense? Your mom and dad, if they don't have an experience in wealth management, which my parents didn't, right? You got to go from a mindset to where some people grow up and they got to think about whether they're going to put cheese on their Whopper or not because they don't have enough money to where they could buy 15 to 20 Burger King franchises. That's a huge difference. That's a paradigm shift. That's something that they haven't encountered before. And so when you're dealing with that three-legged stool that I call your accountant, your attorney, your financial advisor, right? And then you got another one, obviously your agent. When you're dealing with that, make sure that you have qualified people. And I always tell people the rule of three. Interview three people, three different people, and choose the best. All right? I got to get out of here. Thank you so much for your time. Best of luck.